안녕하세요. 조백입니다. 오늘 이 세션 자장을 맡게 됐습니다. 반갑습니다. 음. Um, I'm glad that you are all here. It's quite the full, so it's, it's excellent. Um, I can give you three reasons why you will be very happy that you have attended this, this session. Okay? The number one session, the number one reason is the, um, the, the, the subject matter is really interesting, isn't it? Uh, the title in English is Tomorrow's Workplace for Tomorrow's Workers. I think it's a bit bland. I prefer the Korean version. It says, 내일의 직장에는 어제의 인재가 필요 없다. Well, for the speaker, let me give you a direct translation. It says in Korean, Yesterday's workplace, uh, workforce is useless for the tomorrow's workplace. It's a bit more direct and forceful, isn't it? Yes. So I, I think um, this is a very interesting and timely, timely topic for Korean community here. And in fact, um, the newspaper yesterday had this session prominently featured so I think uh, that might be the reason why this, this session is quite full. The second reason why you will be happy that you have attended this session is the fact that um, we have only one speaker in this session. Now, I have attended other sessions yesterday, and usually they have two, three, four speakers, and maybe additionally one or two discontents, right? So each of them gets maybe anywhere from five minutes to 15 minutes talk. So when you are about to get interested in the talk, talk is over. Well, here you have full one hour and 20 minutes of one single presentation. Isn't that nice? Now we have opportunity to get really deep into the subject matter. Well. There is also a downside. Some of you might wonder or worry, what if the speaker is boring? You got to see through entire one hour with one person. Ain't that a worrisome thing, huh? But I know that some of you who attended yesterday afternoon session, the speaker that we have today is very, very dynamic and forceful. So one thing that you don't have to worry about is becoming sleepy in the session. In fact, he's so dynamic. For those of you who didn't yet have morning coffee, uh, I'm sure he will keep you awake throughout his session. Um, well, that brings to the uh, third reason why I think you'll be happy. Uh, let me... Let me uh, give a, a brief introduction of the speaker, okay? I actually, um, in order to find out a bit more about him, I got into the Google and typed in the name Pepper. There was 1,610,000 sites. I said, wow! Then I realized, uh, whoa, wait a minute. I didn't know that he was a transsexual. <laughs> yeah, I made a mistake. Um, I, I misplaced one I somewhere in there. Then I, I put in the right name. And yet, still, uh, there's uh, 159,000 sites. For a scholar in, you know, at the university, that's an awfully big number. Well, I... Um, punched in a few other things, and he has his own Wikipedia site. And it says, Jeffrey Pfeffer, PhD, is the author of many, many books, 13 books, and he is a professor at, of uh, organizational behavior at Stanford University. And um, I say, hmm, 
Wikipedia. They made a mistake. They made a mistake. He's not a, a professor. He, he is actually the Thomas E. D. professor, the chair professor, which is quite different. Okay, it's different. It's different stat status. And uh, he says that he has written 13 books, and uh, indeed, mm, there are so many good books here, and uh, it's too many, so I will just uh, show you his uh, last uh, six books. And as you can see from uh, the titles, uh, they are very, very important topics, and something to think about. In fact, um, his work is profoundly important, such that um, recently, in a Newsweek, you made a cover page? Cover page of Newsweek. Uh, so I'm very sure that you are going to get a lot of information, a lot of insight from Professor Fepper. So without further ado, let me introduce Professor Jeffrey Fepper. So I will have to say in all candor and honesty that I have been introduced many times by many people and that was by far the best. Uh, both in terms of the content and the substance and the, and the kindness of the introduction. So it is a it is truly a pleasure uh, to be with you this morning. So what I'm going to tell you today is actually not too different from what I have said in prior times when I have come to Korea, for that matter, any other places to give talks. It is a message which we all know, which we have heard before, and which we refuse to do. And so as a consequence, uh, the situation doesn't change very much. Uh, it is a message which is of a combination, I would call it, of despair and hope. It is despair because if you actually look at the condition of the workforce, and I'm certainly not an expert in the Korean workforce, but I'm an expert on the workforce in the United States and in many other industrialized countries, it is a very sad set of circumstances. Uh, a recent public opinion poll asked average employed people, Assuming the recession were to end, big assumption, assuming the recession were to end, what is the first thing you would do? And the overwhelming answer is, look for another job. Which tells me that many people are working in places where their spirits are being crushed, where they are bereft of kind of hope and where they are unhappy. It is a depressing situation because, as we've just learned, layoffs continue apace, even though we know layoffs actually kill people. Uh, there's a lot of epidemiological research which speaks to that, but we, layoffs continue nonetheless. It is an unhappy uh, situation in that many workplaces are filled with distrust, employee disengagement, Workplace bullying, despair, it's pretty sad. You know, it's, people always ask me, how am I doing? And, uh, you know, since I have the best job in the best place, I always say I'm doing perfectly. And then they look at me and they don't know whether to smile or kill me out of envy. So on the one hand, I think there's much to despair about. Uh, we have, I think, workplaces which are unhealthy, uh, they are, and they are certainly very unsatisfactory uh, to the generations now entering the workforce. On the other hand, we have hope because we know what to do to fix these situations. We have in fact known what to do for 20, 30, some might say 40 years, some might say since the time of the Bible or Confucianism or whatever, but in any event, we, we really do know what to do. There's an enormous amount of ev empirical evidence that suggests how to make the world a better place and how to make workplaces both more productive and more humane. And so then the question becomes, are we going to do it? And when will we do it? 
And so we have both hope and despair, and I hope to convince you that we ought to uh, kill the despair and exercise some hope by making the changes that have been around for way too long that we have failed to implement. It is completely clear what the challenges that are faced by companies operating in advanced industrialized economies, such as Korea, the United States, the European Union. Number one, as we go up market with our wages and salaries, there is an increasing emphasis on knowledge work, on creative work, on work that requires intellectual capacity and intellectual engagement. The work that can be done by mindless repetition of simple actions has already been outsourced and as a matter of fact is being outsourced again. As China becomes a high wage country, the work moves to, I don't know, Honduras or Bangladesh or Indonesia or all kinds of places. So the work in advanced industrialized societies is in fact knowledge work with an emphasis on innovation and flexibility. Secondly, there is no one in this room who cannot fail to see increasing global competition. Not only increasing global competition in product markets, but increasing global competition in labor markets. The fastest segment in terms of percentage growth of Indian outsourcing is the Indian outsourcing of routine legal work by English and United States law firms. Law firms said, why should we hire young associates and pay them $100 or $200 an hour to review these boring documents? We can send this work to India, where people speak perfectly good English, and they can review this work for much less money. So there is not only global competition for you know, big screen TVs and automobiles, which is obviously global, but there is enormous amounts of global competition for work as well, including drug development work. Many drug trials are now being run in India uh, as opposed to the United States. Contract outsourcing, and that has also moved up the value chain. It is also lots of data to suggest that in the olden days when Xerox got a patent in 1959 for the fundamental technology for xerography, by 1972, which was 13 years later, Xerox maintained approximately 90% market share with the same patent. Those days are gone. Economic technological change, even in drug development. The economic life of patents is declining immensely. Everybody knows this. There's a lot of data and a lot of systematic studies to show this. So the technological advantage erodes very quickly which means that the only way a company can remain on top is to be a corporate equivalent of Apple computer, which is to invent and reinvent itself on a continuing basis. Think of the rapid cycles that the iPhone and the iPad and all their other products have, have gone through, and this requires innovation, creativity, and technological prowess. So we live in a world of knowledge work where human capital is the true sustaining uh, competitive advantage. All of this requires an engaged, committed, and well-trained workforce. This is so logical, I feel, you know, depressed even saying this to a group of people like yourself who already know everything I have already said. Meanwhile, we confront an entering younger generation workforce which is not going to be satisfied with or put up with the conditions that I and people of my generation or even a few generations younger uh, were willing to put up with. Number one, the current workforce wants more freedom and more work-life flexibility. They live in a world in which information is accessed easily and the whole idea of organizational control, telling people what to do, doesn't quite fit in a Facebook LinkedIn world. And they also want much more flexibility to live their lives. As one person said to me, I saw what happened to my father. He worked for some company for 20, 25 years. He gave his life to the company. They laid him off. 
I don't trust the company to do any different for me. The difference is, is that when they lay me off after 25 years, I will not have given them the best years of my life, which is, I think, right. They're not willing to put that kind of commitment in. They want more discretion and control over their work. They certainly want less hierarchy and control. They don't want to be told what to do by people who don't know anything. And because they have seen, as I've already alluded to, the broken promises of security and career advancement, they are much less loyal and much less willing to make the trade-offs that previous generations were willing to make about, you know, well, you know, I'll put up with this boss, I'll put up with this boring work, I'll put up with this horrible job because I know in the end I'll be in a higher level position and I can give the same lousy conditions to the people working for me. People aren't willing to do that. They don't see the future they want it today. As a form of person I was giving a talk to said, you know, he said, it's interesting. In the olden days, you would send the worker home and say, you know, you screwed up. Here are some corrections that we want you to make. We think you ought to, you know, do a better job. The worker would go home and come back and try harder. Today, you send the worker home and say, this is what we want you to do, and the worker never comes back. They quit. They are not really willing uh, to take the same kind of feedback and direction as they once were, for good or for bad. Regardless of what the new work for workforce thinks at once, what the new workforce has actually received is, you know, they want freedom, they want discretion, they want delegation, and what they get is electronic surveillance of computer use, telephone calls, email, what they do, keystroke monitoring. We have used the modern information technology to provide electronic sweatshops. So it is amazing, even at Stanford University. All of my internet use, I'm sure, is monitored. All of, you know, every time I do, you do something on a computer, your phone calls, all this stuff. According to the American Management Association, the great percentage of all U.S. workplaces, and I cannot believe it's different anywhere else, is monitoring internet and phone use and capturing emails and doing text analysis of the emails. So if you are sending love letters to your boy or girlfriend on the job, trust me, you are providing grist for someone's new work of fiction or fact, depending upon the circumstances. People are monitoring what you are doing even though people don't like it, and even though, by the way, there's a lot of evidence that suggests it doesn't work very well. Even though people say, I would like to make a career with one company, there is less job security than ever, and an extremely tough job market, particularly for those just leaving school, which has caused people to reevaluate their plans to get married, to have children, to move out of the house, to stay moved out of the house, or any of the other things. Even though we live in a world in which people talk about egalitarianism, the networked organization, the idea that we are all colleagues in our work together, you know, we're kind of linked in and socially networked and everything else, the facts are that in virtually every country that I have seen, I don't know about Korea, but it is true most, most places, it is true in the United States, it is true in the United Kingdom, it is true even in Israel, it is true in many, many countries. In this world in which we talk about no hierarchy and we're all in this together, what I kind of call the kumbaya theory of leadership, what you actually observe is increasing levels of wage inequality and wage dispersion. That the difference between what the CEO makes and the frontline or average worker has gone up, not only in the United States, but in virtually every country, not to the same extent as in the United States, but it has gone up literally all over the world. So what the workers want and what the employees are getting are, in case you haven't noticed, quite different. We want freedom, networked, non-hierarchical. What we're getting is computer monitoring, enormous amounts of inequality, and no job security. And this has, you know, if people want one thing and you give them pretty much the opposite, one should not be astounded that virtually every piece of data that I can find shows work attitudes are bad. You know, people want one thing, you give them the opposite, they say, wow, I'm happy. No, I don't think so. 
Distrust of management is rampant. Estimates from various surveys say that from 50 to 66% of all employees don't believe what the organizations are telling them. It's a high level of distrust. A recent Gallup survey showed that 19% of employees are actively disengaged, which means they're actively working to sabotage their company's workplace. 71% are disengaged. They're just kind of watching the clock. In the United Kingdom, a Mercer survey reported that only 40% of the people had faith in their bosses. Towers Parent in 2007, before it became uh, Towers Watson, did a study of employee engagement in 18 countries. A survey of 90,000 employees found that just 21% are engaged with their work, 38% are partly to fully disengaged. They find this in the context of the studies that have been done time and time again, which show repeatedly, as does the Tower study, the firms with the highest percentage of engaged employees outperform the other firms. So there is a payoff to having an engaged workforce, as logic would suggest. Nonetheless, most firms do not. The conference board in the United States reported that job satisfaction is at an all-time low. And the decline has been persistent over the past 25 years. This is not just, we're in a recession, so everybody's miserable. This is a consistent decline in job satisfaction. Only 38% of employees felt that senior management communicates openly and honestly from the Towers Watson study. Between 2004 and 2006, when the recession hit, turnover in the U.S. increased substantially. As soon as the labor market gets better, it's going to increase substantially again. As I tell my friends, do not worry about your employees, because when the job market gets better, you won't have any. They're all headed for the door. It is a very kind of sad state of the workforce that we are facing. Work attitudes remain poor. I've told you about the fact that when employees are asked, many more than half say, I want to go find another job. Even during the height of the recession, a voluntary turnover in the United States remained at a level of over 20%, so that people were leaving. The workplace, you know, th things are not good. And when times get tough, they mostly get worse. So the workplace has become pretty much a nasty and brutish place. A study of 5,000 employees in the United Kingdom found that 25% had been bullied. This is verbal abuse. And 50% had witnessed bullying. A study of 175 registered nurses found that 60% had been verbally abused, yelled at, and insulted by a physician at least once every two months. 27% of a representative sample of Michigan employees reported being victims of psychologically abusive coworkers. When my dear friend Bob Sutton wrote his now famous best-selling book, not the one he wrote with me, the one he wrote on his own, which of course sells much better, The No Asshole Rule, one of the big uses of that book according to him, for people who would write him, is people would write in and say, Dear Bob, I bought your book and put it anonymously on the desk of my manager. The sad thing, the sad thing about the book, the sad thing is to think about, here is a book that presents all kinds of evidence about the downsides of working in an abusive workplace not only for the individual subject to the verbal abuse, but for the organization. The productivity loss, the loss by fear, the loss in terms of reduced productivity is enormous. And nonetheless, the data consistently show, the publication of his book notwithstanding, that not much has changed. Many workplaces are hierarchical, bullying, abusive, where people are expected to do what they are told to do, have no say in what they do, and live really in a state of fear. And Deming's first principle was to drive fear out of the workplace. 
So what should we do? I'll give you three recommendations. We're going to go through these three recommendations, and hopefully we'll have lots of time for discussion and questions. Number one, we need to implement high-performance work practices, things that I've been talking about and writing about for 20 years. Um, we ought to, number two, drive out fear. The w. Edwards Deming and the quality movement are completely correct. The first principle in the quality movement is to drive fear out of the organization. With fear in the organization, almost no improvement is possible. Deming was right, and he continues to be right. Number three, we need to stop trying to control or manage too much and let people use their skills and themselves to help execute the organization's vision. We need to let go, which is pretty much the opposite of what we do. Because the typical human response when confronted with economic stringency or economic hard times, or an economic crisis is to centralize, to pull things in. I can delegate to you when times are good. When times aren't good, I can't trust you to make a decision. I better make them all myself. And we see the re-centralization of control in organization after organization, which is bad because this is contrary uh, to what we need to do to be effective and efficient. High performance management practices. I have given a version of this talk so many times, I could do it in my sleep. And in fact, given my jet lag, I may be, but in any event. There are now probably close to 100 studies in industries ranging from finance to telephone call centers to high-tech electronics to steel, steel mini-mills, Worldwide automobile assembly, multiple industries, high-tech startups represented in the Stanford Project on Emerging Companies, tons of evidence that suggest that there are a set of practices which, when and if implemented, enhance organizational performance. And this is done longitudinally, so you can't make the argument that, well, Organizations that are doing well can afford to do this stuff. This is actually causal in creating organizational performance. The first is employment security and a policy of mutual commitment. It is impossible for me to be to you for you to be committed to me if I am not committed to you. People say to me, Jeffrey, it is 2010. Get over it. There are no organizations that don't lay people off to which I say, wrong. If you look at the great place to work list, at least for the United States, the 2009 great list of the companies that are on the best places to work list, done by the Great Place to Work Institute, you will find an interesting fact. Out of those 100 companies, only 11, only 11 had any layoffs at any point during the recent recession. The percentage for po the population as a whole is probably close to 70%. The difference, 11% versus 70%. There are companies that didn't lay off. One of the tests I give people is to pretend that you are an airline executive. And it is September 12th, 2001. The day after September 11th. No airline is flying. You don't know when you're going to fly again. You don't know the conditions. You don't know how many customers are going to come back. You don't know what the costs are going to be. Every US airline, except one, did what airlines are very good at doing. By the way, that is not taking you to where you want to go on time with your bags. Every airline, except one, announced layoffs, massive layoffs. 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 people. One airline, Southwest, put out an email to its employees that said, in our history, we have never had a layoff or a furlough. We don't intend to start today. We can't promise you anything. Go back to work, do your job, contribute to the success of the company, and together we'll see if we can get through this. The end of the year 2001, Southwest had still not had a layoff, and they, of course, had gained market share. 
To this day, which includes the recent recession, Southwest has never had a layoff. Never. Never. Cyclical industry. It is possible to avoid layoffs. When you lay people off, you send the message. Look out for yourself, because I'm not looking out for you. And the interesting thing is, most people take that message. And so when times are good, intelligent human beings look around and they say, times are good, I have an opportunity to get a better job, I think I will. I'm gone. And that's pretty much what happens. If you are going to have people around for a substantial period of time, you want to recruit them selectively for cultural fit. Do they fit the organization's culture? Do they fit the organization's values? And that is something else that Southwest and many other interesting organizations, including one that I'm going to talk to you about later in some detail, do. Hire people who fit the organization, who fit the values. Skills can be learned. Values are much harder to change. Once you've hired people and they're going to be around a long time, invest in training and development. In the mid-90s, I did some uh, management training with Singapore Airlines, which is an amazing airline. After I flew on Singapore, I decided it was the only airline I was going to try to ever fly to Asia. Uh, so when I came to Seoul, this is kind of like my requirement. I would come to Seoul, put me on Singapore Airlines, the nonstop from San Francisco. Not KAL or Asiana or United or any of these other interesting airlines which have various forms of challenges. Singapore Airlines is the airline to which every other airline aspires. How do they do this? Many people give you the racist theory only Chinese could provide good service or, you know, you have to have young women to provide good service or all kinds of stuff. Turns out Singapore spends 15% of its payroll on training. Not one and a half, not two percent, fifteen percent. And they maintain that training commitment during good times and bad. As they say, anybody can, you know, serve food or not. Everybody flies the same plane. The only thing that differentiates us is our level of service, and that comes from the enormous levels of training that we provide for our workforce as to what to do and how to do it. It's amazing. Sustained investment in training and skill development. Promotion from within. Ah, this is a tough one. Many organizations say, we have a vacancy, let's go out and find the best person. And you know, it's interesting, the best person never looks like the internal person. You know why? Turns out, I, we've done studies of this. The internal person suffers from a huge problem. They're known too well. You always want what looks like in the distance. The distant person looks way more interesting and exotic. It's, by the way, when people live, leave their spouses for their lovers, it seldom works out. The big advantage of the lover is that you didn't know them. <laughs> Once you know them as well as your spouse, you find out that they're pretty much the same person. We did, we, so so the, the, the outside recruit, you have to go recruit them, you have to go throw things at them, you have to work hard to get them, and they look a little exotic. The person inside, we know what they do. They're not super people. They're just like us, only a little bit better. And so the temptation is to go outside to recruit. The outside candidate always looks more desirable, more interesting. The problem is when you continually promote people from outside your organization, you have sent a very interesting message to your employees, which is, you're not good enough. Good enough to do the work, but you're not good enough to ever get promoted. Well, people after a while will get that message and behave accordingly. An egalitarian culture with fewer differences across pay levels and fewer status symbols and perquisites. If we are a team, go look at the football teams. Go look at the soccer teams. You know, when every spring we go to Barcelona, which is like soccer capital, soccer heaven, and we see the famous Messi and his colleagues play, and it's very interesting. They all wear the same uniform. They don't get quite the same money, but they all wear the same uniform, they all practice together, and it's also quite interesting to note that when Barcelona won again and had a great year, one of the comments that was made about what is the difference between their team and Real Madrid, which had gone out and hired a bunch of stars and didn't do very well, the story was 
The difference in Barcelona is they actually had a team that played well together. They knew how to pass the ball. And if you were to see the Spanish team, which is the only game I'm not a big soccer fan, but I did watch them win their final World Cup game, the passing is what stands them. They, they just work as a team amazingly well. And they do that because they understand that even though they have a bunch of stars and colossal egos on the team, in terms of winning, they are all in this together. And so to the extent that you get people to reduce these status distinctions, you are better off. Relatively high pay, contingent on organizational rewards. Southwest Airlines pays more than its competitors in the U.S. airline industry. My colleague who sells tailored men's clothes, the men's warehouse, pays more than other people. You cannot actually win the competitive battle by paying less, having workers and employees who are less motivated and less skilled. As one of my friends said, the question is not what you pay people, but it's what they can do. I say, you know, all my friends want to minimize their pay. He said, it's very simple, close. On the day you close, the pay will be lower. Can't go any lower than that. You will have laid everybody off. Widely sharing information. If you want people to make good decisions, they have to have data. So do open book management, all of which we've talked about in the past. Decentralized decision making. What is good does it do you to have a bunch of highly skilled, well-trained, brilliant human beings who are committed to the organization if you never let them make any decisions? Decentralized decision making. This is very hard to do. I live in an organization where if I want to spend $500 to bring in some people for my class, I have to write a memo to the associate deans. As I say to my colleagues, you guys must have way too much time on your hands. But you know, all this so decentralized decision making. What decisions get down uh, to the lowest possible levels where people are empowered to do the things that make the organization successful. These practices work not only because empirically they've been shown to work, but for some simple logic. What is important for success is discretionary effort, including the acceptance of responsibility and not saying it's not my job. If you want people to do great work, they have to be willing to do go the extra mile. Learning is important in a world in which products are changing all the time. Creativity is important in a world in which the key to success is knowledge work. And to be competitive, you need to be leaner and faster. You need to get rid of all the extra processes and people that make work unproductive. If you think about it, discretionary effort comes from rewards for individual and organizational performance. Discretionary effort comes from also employment security. Who is going to work harder? If the result of their harder and more productive work is going to be either they or their friends are going to lose their jobs. No one. So if you want people to actually implement all the amazing labor and money saving ideas that they have, you need to say there's not going to be any penalty to you when you make us more productive. Discretionary effort comes from teams and Peer monitoring, you will let your boss down, you'll never let your teammates down. Something that every military force understands. Discretionary effort comes from an egalitarian culture in which people believe that they and their contributions are important and valued. From selecting people who want responsibility and from giving people the opportunity to do something that they believe is important and consequential for the world in which they live. Whoops, what did I do? I don't know what I did. Turn this off, oh, I see. Push the wrong button. There we go. Creativity comes from being secure enough to advocate weird ideas. Most of the Apple products that are now famous, if you had gone to somebody 20 years ago and said, people want to like watch TV on these little things, they would say, nobody wants to watch TV on this little thing, it's too small. You have to be, in order to come up with weird ideas, you have to be creative. In order to be creative, you have to feel safe. You have to feel secure. You have to feel that no one is going to tell you, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of but rather say, that may be the dumbest thing or maybe the smartest thing we ever heard, heard of. Let's go find out. Again, an egalitarian culture where everyone can be heard. Most of the best ideas don't come from the top of the organization. They come from the bottom. 
and there's a lot of evidence for that for the people who have studied uh, creativity going back to the days of Thomas Edison. Working in teams, brainstorming, great way to get creative ideas. If you want to be leaner and faster and more productive, the first thing you need to do is delegate and decentralize decision making so you don't have too many people whose sole job is to watch people, watch people, watch other people do the work. The reason why Southwest Airlines is more productive than its colleagues in the airline industry is because they don't have so many layers of management telling everybody what to do. The reason why New United Motors in the United States became the most effective uh, manufacturing facilities, they took out layers of management and most of the industrial engineers and said to the people, you've been working on this assembly line 25 years, you know something about making cars, let's get that knowledge implemented in our production processes. Pay contingent on system performance so the people get the rewards of their efforts, that's another way to encourage productivity. Information sharing so that more people know and can figure out what to do. Employment security so that knowledge does not walk out the door. The big issue that many companies are facing, including, by the way, Stanford University. We did layoffs. We don't practice what I teach. Don't worry, I understand the barriers to doing this. People left. People walk out. And then you say, whoops, we got this computer system. Does anybody know how to make it run? No. Oh, I know what we should do. Let's go back and hire the people that we've laid off. But we don't want to really rehire them, so let's hire them as contract workers. Pay them at least their previous salary, pay the contract employment agency their percentage, and have them come back to do what we can no longer do because we have lost our expertise. This goes on, by the way, all the time. American Management Association survey in the United States found that one-third of all companies had hired back laid-off workers because they needed their expertise. Oops, that really saves money. First I pay severance, then I hire you back at the same salary, then I pay some percentage to the outside sourcing agency. How can that possibly save money? It doesn't. All it does is make people cynical. Drive out fear. The next principle. We talked about high performance work practices and why they work. Drive out fear. Very very, very important. Tell people what is going on. Be honest with them. Tell the truth. Seems like a simple principle. But we don't do it. Pretend you went to a doctor. And the doctor gave you some tests. And now the tests are in. And you go to the doctor and the doctor says, your test results are in. What are they, doctor? I'm not telling you. Fear goes up. To the extent that you don't know, you assume the worst. And this is true in companies as well. I've had people tell me, I can't tell people how bad our organization is doing. They'll head for the door. I said, guess what? They probably think it's doing worse than it is and they're already heading for the door. When you don't share information with people, you signal to them, I don't trust you. And distrust corrodes relationships. Tell people what is going on. Admit mistakes. Admit mistakes. When leaders admit what they don't know and admit their mistakes, it builds trust. People love it. My friend Gary Loveman, who runs Harris Entertainment, the big casino company, his first day of man new management orientation is to tell all his new leaders and managers, all the mistakes he has made running Harris. He says, I hope to convince them by the end of the day that they could never possibly screw up as much as me. But I also hope to convince them that if I'm open with my mistakes, they'll be open with theirs. So he tells people what he did wrong. Very impersonalizing, very open, you know, Steve Wynn, as he said, Steve Wynn, offered him the Macau sub-concession. He said he turned them down flat. He said he should have bought it in a heartbeat, made billions of dollars from that. He tells all kinds of mistakes, one story after the other. Admit your mistakes. You want to drive out fear out of the organization? Give people second and even third chances. Even when they make a mistake. 
Now you know that this goes on. It just doesn't go on in companies. It goes on in families. Some of you probably have children. Some of your children probably did not always live up to your expectations for them. Some of them have let you down. Some of them have done bad things in school or in the playground or who knows what else. How many of you have fired your children? Not too many. With children, you say, you have let me down and you can certainly do better, but we have an evaluative and developmental orientation towards the children. We are going to, get, we are going to help you to be the better people that we know you can and we want you to be. As opposed to employees, which is all kind of grading. You screwed up, you're out. Fine, I fire you. I go back into the same labor pool from which I drew you in the first place, and I draw again and hope I do better. Not a necessarily a good way to improve the quality of my workforce. Here's a philosophy that drives out fear from David Kelly, the head of IDEO product development, the founder of this amazing product development firm. Enlightened trial and error outperforms the planning of flawless intellects and fail early and fail often, which he believes is better than failing once, failing at the end, and failing big. Admitting mistakes. This is him announcing a re major reorganization. This is the best we can think of right now, but the only thing I'm sure of is that this new structure is temporary and it is wrong. We just have to keep experimenting so it gets better all the time. He has built a culture of innovation and a culture in which people understand of that what your job is to do is to do the best you can at the moment, understanding that that best is necessarily imperfect, and that as a consequence, the next iteration will be better, and you just have to keep getting better all the time. Stop trying to control and overmanage people. The best book I've ever read on management is a book called Monty Roberts, by Monty Roberts, The Man Who Listens to Horses, a horse trainer. Not the Robert Redford movie, The Horse Whisperer, but the real horse whisperer, a man who trains horses. It's an interesting thing. If you watch how traditional horse training is done, you take a horse that has never been ridden, and you, the phrase is, break the horse. You take this magnificent creature and you put on blindfolds and chains and restraints and you try to subordinate the horse to your human will. Now the horse will fight back. They buck. They strain against the restraints. Sometimes hurting the horse, sometimes actually killing the rider. Not so good. Dominance. It's a dominance thing. Monty Roberts, and he, by the way, is available on video, so you can see how he does this. Monty Roberts will take the most dangerous horses in the world. Went to England where the stewards of the Queen of England gave him a horse that had never been ridden, and the last person that had been on that horse had been killed, literally. And for any horse, Monty Roberts is on in 40 minutes. Not days, weeks, and months. 40 minutes. How? Monty Roberts understands that the horse is basically a social creature and that the horse basically wants to be cooperative and instead of treating the horse with fear and constraint, you bond with the horse. You let the horse come to you. You treat the horse gently. You let the horse become your friend. His principles use a system, haste makes waste, leave fear and anger behind. Even though this system works better, it is not spread widely. Monty Roberts says, and I quote, there have always been infinitely more men and women inclined to the whip than to the kind word. And when people describe that his system is common sense, he says sense is far from common. The parallels between Monty Roberts and management training should be clear. We hire amazing, talented people. And we bring them into our organizations, and the first thing we tell them is, that's not the way we do things here. Maybe your way, but it's not our way. 
We're going to give you a bunch of rules. We're going to give you a bunch of constraints. We're going to do our version of the whips and chains to subdue you to the LG, the Samsung, the Hyundai, the Stanford, whatever it is way. We're going to take your wonderful creativity and mold it to our system. And at the end, there will be some rebellion. And some people will be lost along the way. And lots of spirit will be lost along the way. The word manage, if you look at the English dictionary, the word manage comes from the root of a word which means to direct a horse. It's true. Monty Roberts and his system has much to change, train organizations. And until he got too old to do so, he would go around to organizations talking to them about a philosophy of managing that was less about control and more about permitting people to use their gifts and skills in the service of the organization. Joey Altman, a celebrity chef, fabulous chef in the Bay Area, one of the great cooks, describes this system perfectly, which is one of the reasons why he is so famous. What I decide is how the basic process should be handled. Not the means to get there, but what the end is. And as far as service goes, I realize that I have 10 waiters and 10 different people. I don't want Daryl to be like Joni. And Joni, I don't want you to be like Susie. Susie, I want you to be the best Susie you can be. I just want you all to be knowledgeable and use your particular and unique strengths of your personality to the best. I'm not trying to shape you into something else. You know, to make Daryl into Joni requires a lot of surgery and a lot of pain and vice versa. It is much better to take people as they are, give them a vision and say, okay, how can you con contribute your gifts and skills to making this the best possible organization? It is a philosophy of management that works, but is used as the exception rather than the rule. So let me now talk to you about one other subject, which is why, given everything that I've said is so completely commonsensical, it even pains me to say it, why is, why is this done so infrequently? I think, number one, there's a misunderstanding of the sources of where real success comes from. There is a lack of courage. It is easier to do what everybody else does than to go your own way. And there is an emphasis on finance instead of people. We worry about the money, which is plentiful instead of talent, which is scarce, which makes, by the way, no sense to me. The conventional wisdom about sources of business success is you need to be first, you need to be in the right industry, you have to be big, which is why we got all these enormous mergers going on, you got to be in high tech, and downsizing and reducing labor costs are important for increasing profits. This is the conventional wisdom under which most companies are operating today, and they are all incorrect. Amazon.com was at least the fourth company to be selling, again, selling books online. Video technology was first developed by Ampex, which nobody has ever heard of. Xerox invented the first personal computer. Nobody remembers that. Diners Club predated the Visa credit card. I don't even know if you can find Diners Club today. Pfizer's Lipitor was at least the third statin on the market. There is no evidence, and there have been studies of this done, there is no systemic evidence for first mover advantage. The end, period, none. There is no evidence that, you are, that there's a first mover advantage. So you don't have to be first with a product or a service in order to win. Does industry matter? Absolutely not. According to studies by both Booz and Mercer Management Consulting, there are no industry effects on companies' ability to deliver shareholder value or on growth rates. There are fast growth companies and slow growing industries. There are slow growing companies and fast growing industries. There are profitable companies in bad industries and there are unprofitable companies in good industries. You are better off being a great organization in a lousy industry. In Money Magazine's 2002 issue, for the preceding 30 years, they look at the highest levels of stock returns. 
Southwest Airlines, an airline, could not be a worse industry. 40% of the industry has gone bankrupt. Walmart stores, retailing, a horrible industry. Kansas City Southern Industries, a railroad. Walgreens, drug retailing, and so it goes. Almost all of these companies are low technology companies operating in extremely competitive industries. Does size matter? You know size doesn't matter. Look at the list of Standard & Poor's, the Fortune 1000 organized by industry. Look at the Fortune 500 organized by industry. And you will find that in many instances, in fact, in most instances, the most profitable companies are not the biggest. Toyota was for many years not as large as General Motors. It was more profitable. The most profitable air airline in the U.S. is Southwest. It is not the largest. The only other airline to have been profitable every year for the past 30 is Singapore. It is also not the largest. The big airlines, BA, Lufthansa, Air France, have lots of troubles. And this is true in financial services as well. In the United States, the most profitable banks are not the big ones. This is true in grocery stores. It's true in industry after industry. You don't have to be big. You need to be good. Mergers don't work. Even though mergers go on all the time, estimates from McKinsey, KPMG, and systematic academic studies indicate that between 70 and 80 percent of all mergers destroy economic value. And then there's downsizing. Good heavens. There is tons of research on downsizing. Downsizing does not increase stock price. A study using census of manufacturing data found that establishments that increased productivity over a 10-year period were as likely to add as to take away people. So downsizing doesn't increase the stock price. It does not positively affect productivity. It does not even always reduce costs. Often the wrong people get downsized. After paying severance, companies often go back into the market to rehire the skills that they have lost. Downsizing does reduce morale and increase fear, particularly if you do downsizing like most companies do it, which is to say we're going to lay off 10,000 people out of our 80,000 person company. Which 10,000? Who knows? So all 80,000 people become panicked. Downsizing hinders innovation by breaking the networks of relationships necessary for developing the connections required to bring new products and services to market, and there is systematic evidence on that. We have misunderstood the sources of company and country success. Where does success come from? Low wages? Low taxes? Absence of governmental regulation? This is what my friend Meg Whitman, who's running for governor of California, claims. You know, we've got to have like a low wages and got to get rid of the unions. Unions are bad and, you know, we can't have too much government regulation. Education and skills of the people, unions, where does success come from? According to the World Economic Forum, which country goes with which growth competitiveness rank? Is it really China and India that are... Ranked high, you know the answer. The countries on whom we turn up our noses, these kind of socialist, weird countries in Scandinavia, with unions, with labor regulation, with all these other things, turned, to rank, turned out to rank pretty high. Why? Because the secret of economic success is not around wages or costs. It is around innovation and creativity. The Economist Intelligence Unit's ranking of the best places to conduct business in the next five years rank Denmark, Finland, Singapore, Canada, Switzerland, Netherlands, and Sweden as high. Countries with educational infrastructure, social infrastructure, and so on. Richard Florida's study of the creative class 
shows that the U.S. now ranks 11th between, behind Ireland, Belgium, Australia, the Netherlands, New Zealand, United Kingdom, Canada, Finland, and Iceland. The Economist Intelligence Unit did a study of where people located R&D and engineering facilities and found that location decisions were based primarily on the availability of talented people. If what we thought created success created success, the Silicon Valley would be empty. We're high cost, high regulated, high tax, high everything. But Google is there, Genentech is there, Amgen is there, Apple is there because we have great universities, great human capital, great talent, and a great innovative culture. And that is the lesson. The lesson is not just, you know, go invest a lot in fancy PhDs, so that's okay. The lesson is to build a culture of innovation, which is a culture, of course, of how you manage your people and understanding the sources of economic success. We know that people management matters for company financial performance. Studies in Germany, studies in Korea understand that when you emphasize people as a source of organizational success and put in a set of consistent policies, you in fact do better. Why don't we do this? Our mental models matter. We see what we expect to see. We create self-fulfilling prophecies. We act on the basis of our assumptions rather than the data, which means knowing the facts and knowing the evidence is essential for running a successful enterprise or, for that matter, having successful and effective public policy. Instead of relying on conventional wisdom and following the crowd, go get the data. It's all over the place. The Internet has made everything available to everybody. You can get the economist units studies of growth competitiveness and plant location decisions. Everything is available to everybody. And what is interesting to me is that the more data are available, the less we use it. And the more we rely on experts and conventional wisdom. Learn for yourself. Choose a strategy to compete in the low-cost, highly competitive grocery store industry. You want to minimize labor costs and minimize product costs? Or do you want to do the opposite? Turns out the opposite is much more effective. The interesting thing is, is that what is required in order to build successful economies or successful companies is the ability to find your own path and to not do what everybody else is doing. When you do what everybody else is doing, what happens? You get approximately the same result. Competitive advantage does not come from following the crowd. Something that Steve Jobs learned a long time ago. What is the profit by bringing out another PC that uses Microsoft Windows 7 and is in a black box using off-the-shelf parts? Can't possibly be high margin. Just cannot. Walmart versus Costco. The average Costco employee earns more. Costco provides more benefits. Which company is more profitable? Costco faces lower turnover, generates more sales per, employ per employee per square foot. Therefore, the profit per employee is higher. Labor rates do not equal labor costs. Labor costs do not equal profits. It is interesting to go through security in San Francisco because at around the same time Singapore Airlines leaves with, I don't know how many flight attendants on their 777, United leaves with a 747 that has fewer flight attendants. Must be cheaper. They got fewer flight attendants. Of course it's cheaper. They also have fewer passengers. And the passenger on there are paying less money. Because the last time I priced Singapore Airlines flights, they're actually higher on all the same routes for both business first and coach class. People will pay more for service. A 
a, an operation that says, we are going to get you on our plane, we're going to get you into our store, we're going to get you to buy our product because we are going to give you a product that is so cheap but also so crappy, is not a winning strategy. Why does Toyota outperform GM, Ford, and Chrysler? It is not the higher retiree costs and the higher medical costs. It's because Toyota receives in the U.S. $6,000 more per car sold. Labor rates do not equal labor costs, do not equal profits. Southwest pays more than its competitors. The question is not what do you pay people, but what do they do for you? If you pay me nothing and I do even less, your costs are actually quite high. Circuit City, an electronics retailer in March 2007 said, we're in electronics retailing, we better cut our costs. So they took their 3,400 highest paid store level personnel and said, we're going to get rid of you. Now, by the way, if you think about it, in a commission-based system, the 3,400 highest based store level personnel were the people who actually knew how to sell electronics retailing. The consequence was amazing. TSR stands for total shareholder return. Compared to their competitors, their sales declined. Best Buy sales increased. Their earnings went down. Their earnings at Best Buy went up. In 2008, Circuit City was bankrupt and is now liquidated. By the way, this was a lesson that no one else learned. So Ford Motor and other U.S. automakers are energetically trying to buy out their more senior employees so they can replace them with inexperienced automakers to make cars. Amazing. The idea is I'm going to get rid of anybody who knows anything and replace them with cheap people who know nothing. They will be cheap, but they will also know nothing. The U.S. airlines also have suffered feedback effects. Cuts in service and poor reliability and fuller flights has led to a huge growth in the use of private aircraft and people not traveling. One industry survey showed that in one year there was $10 billion in foregone revenue from people who said, I would rather not fly. It's an old story. But the market share changes, natural selection means that workplaces will either change or disappear. Southwest is now the largest carrier. Air Asia and Singapore are growing faster than the airline industry. Air Asia based in Malaysia. Toyota has become the world's largest auto company. Davita has taken share from kidney dialysis competitors. Whole Foods Market, a grocery store chain, has grown faster than its industry. And so has the men's warehouse of tailored men's clothing. So when people say to me, Jeffrey, aren't, aren't you depressed because all the changes that you've been talking about haven't happened, I say, actually, they're happening all the time. Market share has shifted from companies that don't know what to do or how to do it to companies that have. And in very similar ways, you can see market share in world trade shifting to countries that understand the importance of innovation, employee engagement, and building human capital. The share of Denmark and Norway and Sweden and Switzerland and the world economy is growing, while the shares of their low-skill, low-wage competitors is actually declining. Let me leave you with one example, kind of a case study that I got to learn firsthand. Kimberly Clark in the Andean region. The Andean region, for those of you who don't know, includes the countries of Venezuela with Hugo Chavez, he's a little weird, Peru, Colombia, which is probably known more for drugs than for paper products. Ecuador, which has got all kinds of political splits, and Bolivia. These are five relatively small countries. We're not talking about Brazil. We're not talking about Argentina. Certainly not talking about Korea or any other dynamic economy. The company had been built in part through acquisitions of lower competitors. And this is Kimberly Clark. They are selling paper towels. They are selling Kleenex. They are selling feminine hygiene products. These are low-tech, low-margin products. We're not selling computers. We're not selling iPhone apps. We're selling paper. In 2004, growth had stagnated. The emphasis was on cost-cutting. And then they hired an Argentinian named Sergio Nakach. 
between 2004 and 2008 in these five little crummy countries, Sergio doubled sales and tripled profits in four years. Paper products. He didn't introduce, you know, iPhones or LG displays. Still selling paper. Doubled sales, tripled profits. What did he do? He did essentially everything that I have been talking to you about. First, he built a people first winning organizational culture. People come first. And that meant people come first. We train people first. We take care of our people first. We hire the best people. We engage them in the work. We build all the things that we've talked about. They will take care of the business results. Decentralized decision making. Even in these five countries, even within regions within the five countries, so that if one part of Peru had a feast day at a different time than another part of Peru, you could custom tailor your promotions to the different indigenous peoples, the different dialects, and you could match, which got you know much better product placement on the part of the retailers. Invested and gave back to the community. They took a share of their profits and reinvested them into the community, which of course made everybody quite proud. Invested in training and development. Everybody got trained. Frontline people, the senior management team. This was something that he was committed to. Celebrated successes. Lots of parties. Lots of Pisco Sours, which is the Peruvian drink. Tastes sweet, but if you have about 10 of them, you can't stand up. Lots of recognition, lots of trophies, lots of celebration of success. Instituted informal dress. Never saw Sergio in a suit. Never heard anybody call Sergio Mr. Nakach. It was all Sergio. Everybody called everybody by their first names. No security in the office. Everybody wandered around. Everybody was like, we're a team. And together, this team is going to build the most effective paper products company that the world has ever seen. Management became very visible. At the end of this process, in the year 2008, these five countries, which account for almost nothing, and if you think about the global paper market, accounted for 42% of the increase in net operating income for the entire Kimberly Clark Corporation, a $19 billion company. And Sergio's reward is he's been moved to Dallas. And as I say now, it is Sergio versus the Kimberly Clark culture to see whether he can actually create this change in the rest of Kimberly Clark or whether Kimberly Clark will grind him into dust. I'm actually betting on Sergio, but we'll see how this works its way out. Change is possible. It is possible in Kimberly Clark in the Andean region. We're not talking about years. We're not talking about decades. We are talking about a relatively quick transformation. Continental Airlines went from worst to first in on-time performance in a year and then, by the way, went back. Kaiser Permanente, a healthcare organization in the Colorado region, Magma Copper, the New Zealand Post, which is their postal system, Davida Kimberly Dialysis, uh, a kidney dialysis company. In each instance, not only was change possible, but change was accomplished within a relatively short period of time, within six months. Anybody who tells you culture change takes a long time, don't believe them. The first thing I tell you is culture change takes a long time. We've all been to school. If I tell you the culture change is going to take four years, you're going to start at year three and a half. Just like when I told you your assignment was due December the 8th, you began on December the 6th. Worry, work about deadline effects. Change is possible. It does not take a long time. The strategic implications of what I have said are absolutely clear. It is crucial to attract and retain the best people, which means you need to worry about your immigration and diversity policies at both the national and the company level to not foreclose any talent. U.S. competitive success has come mostly from its attractive and open labor market. Andy Grove came from Hungary. Contract manufacturer Selectron was founded by Winston Chen. Uh, Winston Chen. Sergey Brin came from Russia. You can go down the list. The first Japanese to win a Nobel Prize was working for a U.S. company in the United States. 
and it also involves putting women into meaningful work roles. You cannot compete successfully if you can find half of your workforce to subordinate roles just on the basis of gender. It is crucial to attract and retain the best talent. Even in Japan, high-skilled work visas are increasing. And by 1999, high-skilled foreign workers were 40% of the number of Japanese graduates entering the labor force. Even Japan, which is relatively closed, has started to open up. Another implication, the strategic role of senior leadership Provide for a culture of fact-based or evidence-based management. Do not act on what everybody else does. Everybody else could be doing the wrong thing. Act on the basis of the data. Get the facts. Uncover and examine and help people understand and change their mental models about how mindsets work. Most companies spend way too much time thinking about costs and not nearly enough time thinking about revenue. You give me enough revenue, I don't care what my costs are. And you give me too little revenue, and I will never get there by just cutting costs. It is a revenue model. Most of the successful organizations in financial services, in airlines, in men's clothing, in grocery stores, in electronics manufacturing, have worked and have succeeded by building a revenue-driven model. Apple worries about its costs long after it worries about, can I give products to people? that they will basically pay whatever I ask and line up days in advance in stores to buy these products. This is a revenue model. Not that they don't are concerned about costs, but it is revenue first. That's what I thought. Good. We're almost done. We need, for, we need courage. We need to get beyond benchmarking, which I've talked about before. We need to engage in systems thinking the importance of feedback effects, the idea of interdependence among the actions that we take. All of this is possible, and I hope you will do it. I believe we have two minutes left, which is probably just enough time to begin to answer some of the questions that you have. So we will take questions, comments, or whatever. Thank you so much uh, for staying awake and paying attention, and I hope this will stimulate your thinking as you make both yourself, your society, and your companies ever more effective. It is always an honor and privilege uh, to be with you in Seoul, Korea, and I'm thrilled to have been invited again. Thank you. What did I tell you? Uh, I give you three reasons why you would be happy that you are here today, and I think you got your money's worth. Um, his talk uh, is full of evidence uh, supported by research and he spoke with great energy and passion which isn't easy when you're suffering from jet lag uh, and thirdly um, he has a great sense of humor uh, which sometimes is lost in the translation not because the uh, translators are bad but um, it, the humor is all about timing and there's a time lag in the translation. But um, uh, still, uh, still, because of that, uh, he has been able to sustain you for one, uh, one hour, 20 minutes. I think um, you are very much convinced uh, of his message. And um, I have a really uh, one quick question. People here, I'm sure that they are fully convinced that um, the workers need more autonomy and less hierarchy, uh, more creativity and less mundane work, more meaningful work and less mindless work, and more chance for professional development, uh, such that the company put the people first. I know they are all convinced, but how can they go back to their work and convince your bosses, your CEOs and directors that uh, they should um, embrace your message? Well, one answer is that they can go start their own companies. But uh, <laughs> I think another answer is to bring, I mean, everything I have said today is based upon research and literature and evidence. It comes not just from me, but from many other people. 
It has been repeated many times. Uh, it is the wisdom of many of the leading HR consulting companies, including Hewitt and Watson. It is the wisdom of many of the management consulting companies. Uh, so what I would suggest is that you bring back into your organization the sources of this material. You can find a lot of this stuff on Google or on scholar.google.com, which gets you access uh, to much of the, um, it's kind of a beta site that Google has been developing for a long time that gives you access to the research literature. Uh, it is literally scholar.google.com. Uh, and so to bring to people the facts and the evidence and the data and to show them the World Economic Forum's list of the most competitive countries, uh, to show them the great place to work list of the most, uh, uh, the best places to work and to show the charts from the great place to work website that looks at the relationship between being a great place to work and financial performance. I mean, there's all kinds of information out in the world uh, that makes the case that I have made. And so one of the things I suggest to people is that it is your job to educate uh, yourself and your colleagues about the truth and, uh, and, and bring that information forward. Thank you. Um, it's amazing that the, uh, the time is up, but then no one is leaving this place. But uh, 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 I've been told that uh, we have to close this session. So I'm very sorry that we don't have really time for questions from the floor. But then I'm sure that uh, you are all welcome to come up here and talk to him directly uh, during the break time. Uh, again, I thank you very much for your attendance. Let's give a one last applause for our speaker.